Hello, scholars. Mr. Long here. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War. Before we get into the content, let's go ahead and clarify something. This conflict is going to go by two different terms. First one, Seven Years' War. This is the name for the war on the world stage. And the French and Indian War. This is a term found almost exclusively in North America, so here in the United States. During the course of this video, I'm going to try to refer to this war as the French and Indian War. However, if I misspeak and say the Seven Years' War, or you see the Seven Years' War on the slides, just know that that term, Seven Years' War, is synonymous with the French and Indian War. So they're the same conflict, even though they, there may be two different names. So let's go ahead and dive into the French and Indian War. In the century leading up to the French and Indian War, the major powers of the world, France, Spain, and Great Britain, were on again, off again combatants. They were almost fighting a war, it seems like, every decade or every couple of decades. Here are a couple examples on the slide that you should be able to view. The personal favorite, for me at least with the name, is the War of Jenkins' Ear. And I don't know very much about this war, but what I do know is that the war began with a single act a couple years before the war itself broke out in 1739. The act itself was there was an English vessel that was boarded by the Spanish Coast Guard, and in a confrontation between the Spanish Marines and the English sailors, a sailor named Jenkins had his ear slashed off with a Spaniard saber. That insult and that slight during a time of peace is going to lead to emotions boiling over in Great Britain, and it's going to lead to war being declared between uh, Spain and their, and their ally France against Great Britain. The war itself, not overly extensive, but just the cause of that war kind of coming from that one incident, it's pretty fantastic as far as history goes. When we're looking at the French and Indian War, especially the outbreak, the key area we're looking at is the Ohio River Valley here in the United States. The map on the bottom left has the Ohio River outlined in red. Note that on the western end of the Ohio River, it bleeds into and flows into the Mississippi River, one of the main waterways of North America. Now, you may be asking, Mr. Long, why is this war starting with a river of all things? Well, fair enough question. First reason is that this is the 18th century. This is a time before paved highways like 211 or 66. This is before airplanes and airports. This is before trains. So the best way to move people and goods are on barges and boats on rivers. So if you can control the river, effectively that's like controlling the highway where you can move people along or goods, supplies, um, and things along, that, along those lines. Another reason is that the Ohio River Valley was rich in natural resources, either animal pelts, uh, furs that were highly sought after by Europeans, as well as lumber and other natural resources. So if you controlled the valley, you had access to natural resources, which you could then sell for money. It also gave you a means to transport those natural resources out to the ocean to then go trade with other nations. The Ohio, the Ohio River Valley, like the map on the left, flows more or less along this line between the English settlements in that salmon color and the French co colonies in that blue color. Since it's falling between the two, both the English and the French are going to lay claim to it. The French want it so that they can make that money. And in addition to that, because they want to link up their northern colonies up here with their southern colonies down here. And as you can see, there's a pretty wide gap between the two with a few, sp with a few forts sprinkled in between. But the French really want to be able to link up their colonies to unify them. The English, on the other hand, do not want the French to link up, and they themselves are going to want to lay claim to the Ohio River Valley.
the French are going to exert their claim. They're going to try to actually make their claim a reality by sending a group of soldiers and engineers to the confluence, the place where three rivers meet. These rivers are the Ohio, the Monongahela, and the Allegheny rivers. If you're familiar with baseball, especially the Pittsburgh Pirates, you may uh, have heard of Three River Stadium. That was the old Pittsburgh Pirate Stadiums before PNC Park was built, and it was called Three Rivers because this is where the three rivers meet. Now, in order to control the rivers, you want to be able to build a fort along the river to then deny passage to your enemies. So if this little Y up here, if this is our area around what becomes Pittsburgh, you have the Allegheny River on the, in the north, the Monongahela in the south, and the Ohio River heading west towards the Mississippi River. Now the French are going to build a fort that they're going to name Fort Duquesne at the confluence of these rivers so that anyone traveling west, north, or south have to go past this fort and their big old cannons. And if you're the English and the French control it, you're going to have a bad day working on those boats. So the French are building this fort at Fort Duquesne. The colony of Virginia does not want France to build this fort because they want to control the Ohio River Valley and having a good fort at this crossroads is a good way to control the valley. So the Virginia governor is going to send an officer with the Virginia militia, you may have heard of him, a guy named George Washington. Yes, that George Washington, the guy on your, on your money. The governor is going to send Washington with a group of militiamen north to try to kick the French out. A couple miles from the fort, the Virginians, as well as their Native American allies, are going to ambush a French working party. In the shootout, the French officer is killed. And this is going to be a huge problem for Washington and the Virginians because that officer was the brother of the overall French commander at Fort Duquesne. So, as makes sense, when the French commander at Fort Duquesne, when he learns that his brother was killed, he dispatches a larger force to exact revenge on Washington and his militiamen. That force is going to surround George Washington at Fort Necessity, a little ramshackle wooden fort that Washington tried to build to defend himself. And Washington and his men are going to be soundly defeated. After the defeat, Washington is forced to withdraw. He's allowed to retreat with full military honors because old-timey military stuff was way too fancy for our uh, modern palates, our modern tastes. Uh, but this incident itself is going to start to snowball into what becomes known as the French and Indian War and the Seven Years' War. After the incident at outside Fort Duquesne, different nations are going to start to pick sides. For our purposes, we're just going to refer to us and them, the good guys and the bad guys. For us, there's a whole bunch of nations that are jumping on the side. Because again, this is World War Zero. This is the first global war. But the main ones I want you to be familiar with are Great Britain, Prussia, and the Iroquois Confederacy, especially Great Britain, and the Iroquois Confederacy. That's a group of Native American tribes centered around the Great Lakes in New York and Canada. For the bad guys, the main one I really need you to know are France and Spain. Russia and the Holy Roman Empire, they're throwing thousands of troops into this war as well, so they're pretty big players. But from the American perspective, France and Spain are going to be the main ones, as well as the Abenaki Confederacy. This is another group of Native Americans that are going to fight, this time against the British and the, and the Iroquois. Now, we use the term French and Indian War throughout this conflict. That makes it really easy to remember, oh, it was the British versus the French and the Indians. Well, there were Native Americans that fought on both sides, some with the British, some with the French, but in general, 
more Native Americans are going to side with the French than the British. And so we associate the bulk of the Native Americans with the French, so they kind of get that Indian part with the French and Indian War. Here are a couple of maps that I'm hoping that will illustrate how global this conflict was. For uh, the Americans over here in the New World, we have conflict happening in the Ohio River Valley as well as some boat stuff going on in the Caribbean. In Europe, this is going to be the primary theater of operations for the commanders. Most of the fighting is happening around poor old Russia with France trying to get at them, the Holy Roman Empire coming north, and Russia coming from the east. And we're going to see a fella named Frederick the Great absolutely demolish army after army after army even though he's outnumbered and running back and forth to all these uh, battlefields to defend prussia finally in the bottom left we have fighting happening in india so we have north america involved in the fighting central america involved in the fighting europe involved in the fighting and south asia in the fighting so truly this is world war zero the first world war As I mentioned previously, the primary zone of combat was around Prussia and modern-day Germany, where Frederick the Great is going to go to great lengths, ha, great, great lengths to repel the French, the, the French, the Russians, and the Austrians and Holy Roman Empire, um, usually outnumbered around three to one, two to one at each battle. If you're interested in uh, successful tactical commanders and the crossover between politics and military. Frederick the Great is a phenomenal example of that and someone worth reading into. During the course of the war, France is going to invest so much uh, strength, their troops, their supplies, their money, into fighting in Europe that they're not adequately able to defend North America from the British. And this is something that a fella named William Pitt is going to exploit. And he was credited as saying America was conquered in Germany because the Prussians distracted so many resources from France. It's going to allow the British and the American colonists to overcome the French and their Native American allies in the New World. So back over in North America, after the debacle with George Washington, total failure, the British are going to send a seasoned general, someone with experience, named General Braddock. Braddock was a veteran of multiple wars, and he is going to arrive with a group of British regulars. These are the battle-tested, trained, drilled redcoats, the lobster backs, as you will. And these redcoats are going to arrive and start to plan an operation to go capture Fort Duquesne from the French. So where George Washington failed... Braddock thinks, you know what, maybe if I bring in some professional soldiers and some big cannons, I can be successful. And we're going to see how well that works out for him. Braddock is going to assemble about 2,000 soldiers, mostly British regulars, so the professional army, as well as colonial militia, who we can refer to as buckskins. These are the mountain men, the wilderness guys, the fellows who have been living out in the woods, scraping out a living in the colonies. They're called buckskins because as hunters, they're going to be hunting deer and then wearing the buckskins as uh, part of their clothing. Um, they're going to fight in an irregular fashion, whereas the British fight in line and columns with muskets. The buckskins are going to be hiding behind trees, hiding behind rocks, more of in a guerrilla hit and run kind of style. It doesn't mesh well with the British, uh, how formal the British are with their tactics. While advancing towards Fort Duquesne, Braddock is going to insist on bringing large cannons, big old artillery, for his assault on the fort. Keep in mind, this is 18th century, so still no major highways, still no airplanes. So if you're moving cannons, you're doing it by hand or with horse teams through the woods. So they're building the road as they go, they're building bridges, they're chopping down trees. It's slow, so the French have plenty of time to prepare for them, and it's exhausting. So their poor soldiers are already tired before they even reach Fort Duquesne. 
a few miles from Fort Duquesne, the French are going to set up an ambush. Because again, they know the British are coming. The British aren't being very sneaky with their red coats and their cannons and building a literal road as they move. During the ambush, the British are going to have a very, very bad day. Washington is going to have two horses shot out from him and a number of bullet holes through his coat. Fortunately for him and the future United States, he is going to survive unscathed. But that just illustrates how intense the fighting was that Washington was in direct fire time and time again. Braddock led his troops bravely. However, he is going to be mortally wounded. The British regulars, the guys who are supposed to be trained to stand and fight, they're going to run. They've never fought in an ambush style as the Native American and the French, they're ambushing the British. They're not used to that. So they're going to get out of town as quickly as possible and run away. And we're going to see some consequences of that at the end of this video. After the defeat of Braddock, things are going to go poorly for the British. The French are going to go on to victory after victory, and things are going to go be going very well for the French. In 1758, a British politician named William Pitt, guy I referenced earlier with the, uh, the quote, he is going to take over wartime operations in the New World. William Pitt identifies North America as being relatively weakly defended by the French. And if he can just get enough troops and supplies to the New World, he can overwhelm the French and claim a victory in North America. So he's going to send more troops, more supplies, more money, better leaders. He's even going to get rid of some of the older leaders that were a little timid or slow and get in young, aggressive, vigorous leaders that would take the offensive and take the fight to the French and hopefully beat them at their own game. In 1759, Pitt's plans start to bear fruit. He is going to oversee numerous victories, especially at the French city of Quebec. At Quebec, the British are going to defeat the French in an old school, you know, let's line up and shoot each other fight on a place, at a place called the Plains of Abraham. And while that may sound pretty epic and biblical, it's such an underwhelming name, or the story behind it is, more, is underwhelming for the name itself. With the Plains of Abraham, you're picturing, picturing something cool and biblical. In reality, it was just a bunch of farmland owned by a guy named Abraham. So it was just Abraham's farm, but the Plains of Abraham has such a nice poetic ring to it. Let's just keep calling it that. In 1763, after a series of defeats uh, following the French defeat at Quebec, the French are going to agree to sign a treaty with the British ending the war. So let's take a look at some of the results of that. The biggest result for us here in U.S. history class is that the colonial possessions of Spain, France, and Great Britain are going to start to get mixed around. I know the slide says, and Portugal, for world history, that's significant. But for us here in U.S. history, we really want to focus on Great Britain, France, and Spain. France is going to cede or give land east of the Mississippi River to Britain. So that's going to be a key bullet for your notes. France is going to cede possessions east of the Mississippi River to Britain. Uh, most of Canada, also important. Grenada, northern Sarkars, not super important for U.S. history, so don't worry too much about that. Instead, focus on land east of the Mississippi River and most of Canada to Britain. France is also going to give some territory to Spain. Spain and France were allies. Spain joined the war to help France, but they lost. So France gave Spain kind of like a participation trophy. Hey, thanks for trying. Here's uh, some territory, and let's call it even. Spain is going to give Florida to Great Britain. Uh, not super important because, again, that first bullet is the one that for our class I want you to be the most familiar with. Another significant aspect, British victory is going to solidify the British as the world's most powerful country. Before the French and Indian War, France and Britain were kind of even. They were both equally powerful. But after the French and Indian War, the British themselves are going to move up and they're going to become more and more powerful and they're going to dominate most of world affairs and world politics for the next 100 to 200 years. 
Here is a map illustrating some of those ter territorial uh, trades that occurred. If you're looking at the map on the left, that's 1750 before the war, 1763 at the end of the war. So France, before the war, had a whole bunch of cool stuff up in this area of Louisiana and New France up around the rivers. After the war, that territory east of the Mississippi River is going to become English, and west of the Mississippi is going to become Spanish. In effect, with the exception of a little bit of stuff in the Caribbean, France is effectively gone. North America is going to be divided between Spain and England, and this is going to create a power shift in the New World that is going to lead to some problems with the Native Americans as well as with English colonists leading to the American Revolution. So, as I just said, kind of important, the French are now totally out of North America. The colonists are also going to gain confidence in their military capabilities and what they can accomplish. For example, at uh, Braddock's defeat, the English colonists, the Buckskins that were there, they watched the British Redcoats uh, suffer a defeat and then flee the battlefield running. And the colonists start to think that the British aren't so invincible and aren't so over the top overpowered as maybe they had been led to believe before witnessing their defeat firsthand. Friction between the British and the colonists is going to start to boil over. Before the French and Indian War, remember, the British gave the colonies a lot of freedom. They kind of let them do their own thing. Yeah, go play over there in the corner. Just don't hurt yourself. But during the war, with British supplies and support and generals and troops coming over, the British start to exert their dominance as the mother country over the colonies. And this is going to lead to some friction because the colonies who are used to being independent and having more freedoms now are being babysat in a way that they weren't necessarily accustomed to. The British also tended to look down on the colonists. They saw the colonists as uh, quitters and failures who left the old world in Europe because they just couldn't cut it. They weren't good enough for the old world. And so because they bailed and came to the new world, they're not as successful as those who stayed behind and were able to make something of themselves in the old world. So that looking down the nose of the by the British to the American colonists is going to cause some dissension and some issues later on that's going to help, again, fuel some of this idea of maybe we shouldn't be friends with the British anymore and maybe have a revolution. For the French, while the French were a threat in the colonies when they still had possessions, the colonists were forced to rely on the British for protection. Without the French being around, the colonists start to think, you know, why do we still need support and protection from the British? Do we still need British troops here in North America if there are no French to defend us or to defend us from? Uh, this is going to start to cause some problems as the American colonists start to see British protection and British influence as unnecessary. The Native Americans, they are going to lose their greatest asset, their greatest weapon against the Europeans, which was their ability to play one off against the other. So that if the British refuse to sell muskets to the Native Americans, well, maybe the French will because the French are going to want an ally against the British. Without having that, the Native Americans now have no leverage against the British or against any of the colonists, and they're going to start to decline and face a lot of issues. We're going to see something called Pontiac's Rebellion. That's going to be a big part of the next lesson in the Proclamation of 1763. These are going to be some negative consequences for pretty much everybody, the colonists and the Native Americans, following the end of the French and Indian War. So there is a quick video on the French and Indian War. If you guys have any questions on this, make sure to let me know either through email or text. Uh, you guys should have my contact information through Canvas, so be sure to reach out. And go ahead and check this video off your checklist, and I will see you guys next time. Mr. Long, over and out.